Good afternoon. It's just still the morning here in the, the US. Um, I guess I'd like to thank the organizers for arranging this really interesting meeting. I've certainly learned a lot over the past couple of days. And I guess one of the things is that there's still so much to learn about uh, diffusion in minerals and diffusion chronometry. But today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a method that we've been developing that will allow us to kind of explore the uncertainty structure associated with diffusion time scales from these kind of simplistic models that I guess Dan uh, was talking about earlier. Uh, so John McLennan was originally uh, supposed to give this talk, but couldn't make it today. And he told me I had to include a picture of a volcano. So here it is. Um, so I'm mostly going to be talking about uh, volcanic and magmatic systems where maybe life is a little bit easier. Um, but maybe a lot of the concepts I'm also going to talk about could be applicable to the more complex settings of uh, metamorphic petrology. Okay, so as Dan and Chiara mentioned uh, a bit earlier, um, the kind of diffusion chronometry has really exploded in uh, volcanic petrology. And this is because it offers us a w um, kind of the main way we can link uh, petrological observations. Um, we make it depth and understanding what's happening in the bowels of a volcano. And, and then we can link these to maybe surface expressions and geophysical observations related to monitoring data. And so I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room who have already done this sort of approach where they've modeled some diffusion times and then compared them to uh, eruptive precursors. And this may help us ultimately uh, forecast when eruptions might happen or understand certainly what's happening at depth. And as Chiara's mentioned, uh, and Dan, uh, there's, some there's still some complexity associated with uh, volcanic systems. And even in kind of processes uh, that may operate uh, years or even minutes before an eruption, there may be variability in the crystal cargo, the zoning patterns, and ultimately um, the diffusion time scales. And so here's a, a discrete element model by uh, George Bagant. And what this is looking at is the kind of crystal crystal interactions as well as the, as the, the fluid dynamics um, associated with uh, the injection of like a new mag um, a new magma into like a sill like body and basically uh, what i want you to take from this is uh, the fluid dynamics can be quite complex the crystal histories can also be quite, quite complex where maybe crystals are interacting um, with um, with the new melt at different times, they may also be experiencing slightly different uh, thermal histories and may ultimately give um, different diffusion time scales. Um, likewise, even in like the, the final ascents upon in like the volcanic conduits, there may be complexities associated with perhaps velocity gradients uh, across the conduit um, due to this maybe no slip condition, which we often see uh, in the form of like tube-like punices. So, this may be expressed in variability in zoning or diffusion time scales of very fast diffusing elements like lithium or, uh, or hydrogen. Um, and so um, in order to be able to be a bit more confident in linking our diffusion time scales to um, these volcanic monitoring methods, as well as maybe try, trying to possibly uh, resolve some of this natural variability, um, it's quite important to try and uh, get more robust estimates of uncertainty on diffusion time scales. And maybe at the moment, maybe our uh, uncertainties are, are too large, but maybe in the future we can maybe beat down uh, some of these uncertainties. So um, what I'm going to be talking about today is an approach where we can, or, or a framework where we can account for a lot of uncertainties in our diffusion time scales. And so um, this is this basically combines some finite element diffusion models with a, a nested sampling uh, Bayesian inversion approach. And then if I have some more time, if some time at the end, then I will go through, through some uh, case studies from Iceland that I've been working on. So as we've heard a lot in the last couple of days, there's lots and lots of sources of uncertainty uh, associated with uh, diffusion chronometry. Um, Dan and Chiara have touched upon some of these most notably temperature uh, and the assumptions associated with isothermal versus non-isothermal approaches. There's other parameters like pressure, FO2, the composition, so and activities in the melt, the composition of the minerals themselves. 
Uh, Chiara also pointed out that uh, there's uncertainties in the diffusion coefficients and their associated parameters, which are also quite important. And then there's also other things uh, like our assumptions about the magmatic system, so initial conditions and boundary conditions and, uh, and also things like sectioning effects. But for this talk, I'm mostly going to be focusing on uncertainty in the diffusion coefficients as well as uh, some of the intensive parameters as well, and potentially touching upon some initial conditions. Um, so just briefly touching upon sectioning effects that uh, Dan talked about uh, at least a little bit. Um, so now in kind of the igneous community, people are starting to develop these uh, 3D finite difference models um, to try and combat this. Um, but in, in a lot of cases, the 1D approach is um, uh, maybe adequate. But um, so as like Thomas mentioned yesterday, it might be a bit of a dangerous road going, going up to, to higher dimensions. And so I'm going to be maybe a little bit of a enabler and walk this dangerous road a bit. And so I'm just going to quickly talk about um, how we can use finite elements to basically um, efficiently model uh, some of these complexities associated with um, crystal geometry. And so basically, uh, uh, finite elements is a way of solving partial differential equations um, numerically, uh, and it involves a collection of cells with a uh, local function space, which together creates this mesh. And um, the meshes can be of different shapes, uh, often they're triangular in 2D or tetrahedral in, um, in 3D. But you can also have other forms such as uh, rectangular or hexagonal. And so this really makes it quite flexible and easy to create these complex geometries. So here's a 2D uh, section of a, a olivine crystal. Here's a spinel crystal. And perhaps another source of, uh, of power is we can actually refine our mesh so we can make it finer where we're interested in diffusion taking place, maybe close to to crystal edges. You can also make the mesh coarser where diffusion's most maybe not happening so much. So this can make our models more efficient. Um, so there's a lot of um, software available that can create these meshes. Uh, one's called GMesh. And so for our finite ele uh, element modeling, uh, we use the software called uh, the Phoenix Project, um, which is uh, open source. It has a Python-based interface. Um, it was initially developed for like engineering purposes, but we kind of tried to move this to the ge uh, world of geology. And so this can efficiently solve uh, partial uh, complex partial differential equations. Uh, there's now these iterative um, solvers, which can really efficiently solve very large meshes. And also we can uh, use the, uh, solve diffusion in multiple domains. So a bit like what Thomas was talking about yesterday. Um, and so here's an example I'm currently working on. Um, looking at diffusion of water from uh, melt inclusions. And so here we can create this very complex 3D mesh, which almost represents um, a typical olivine crystal. And we can include lots of melt inclusions. And we can account for the conservation of flux across the boundary between um, the melt inclusions and, um, and the crystals. And perhaps maybe something for the future is now that um, CT technology, oh, uh, tomography is improving and it might be possible to start segmenting um, CT images of natural crystals so then we can maybe make 3D meshes of natural crystals if it's appropriate. Um, and so uh, as Chiara mentioned, the uncertainties in the diffusion parameters are, are really, really important in some instances. And often uh, the way they're published in experimental studies over the last I don't know, a few decades. So here's an example for magnesium diffusion in plagioclase from uh, Van Orman et al. And what you often see is you have uh, your, this Arrhenius style relationship. There's the uh, activation energy. Um, there's actually a typo in this paper. They didn't include uncertainty here. But um, off, and then there's uh, pre, the pre-exponential factors. And often they're quoted with the uncertainties and often people will be tempted oh we can just um, we can just use these values um, but actually there's a little bit of subtlety uh, underlying this that can be quite important and so here's a uh, an Arrhenius plot that we saw a lot of uh, yesterday and um, basically when we're fitting our diffusion experiments 
to get the slope, which is the activation energy, and then I intercept, which is our, our D naught. Um, these parameters are actually uh, correlated. So in order to have like a steeper slope, you need a, uh, a steeper or a higher intercept. Um, so this underlying covariance can be really important when we're trying to consider propagating our uncertainties. And so one approach that we've tried to do uh, over the last couple of years is we've subsequently made uh, some new uh, multiple linear regressions through um, the olivine diffusion data sets that kind of Summit and Ralph Doman have compiled and some of a lot of their experiments. And we use this, this kind of form here uh, along the 001 direction. And so this allows us to create these uh, covariance matrices um, that allows us to assess correlation and covariance between all of these parameters uh, in, the, uh, in the empirical fits. And so here's, here's a table of um, these covariance matrices for different elements and different mechanisms. And so here's a plot just comparing our, our, our empirical fits performance compared to the, the previous version. And they're almost or pretty similar, almost identical, which is uh, very good. And so uh, I'm just going to reiterate a lot of what uh, previous speakers have said. Um, if you're wanting to do this yourself, then um, you really have to be aware of um, how applicable the diffusion experiments are to the conditions that you're interested in, as well as the crystal compositions. So um, basically, the diffusion mechanism can change under different conditions. So the slope may change. Um, and so, and also for like the metamorphic people, yeah, there's the danger of extrapolating down to uh, lower temperatures. And also, yeah, you need to be aware of um, whether your, the experiments are done on synthetic crystals or natural crystals because um, the diffusion mechanisms can, can change. Um, okay, so now we need like a, a framework in which we can uh, account for a lot of these sources of uncertainty. So things like in the, tens the intensive parameters as well as all our little coefficients that we call parameters in our diffusion coefficients. And so to do this, we used uh, Bayesian inference, which is a statistical method that uses um, Bayes theorem in order to update a probability of a model as more, more information becomes available. And so here's uh, Bayes theorem. And what it does is it links what we call a posterior distribution. And what this is, is the probability of our parameters. So what this is what sigma is. So this is our parameters that go into our model. So things like the temperature, the, the pressure, the diffusion coefficients, um, even time. And this is based, uh, this is the probability of the parameters given the data. So this is the thing that we've measured or our compositional profiles uh, and our hypothesis or models. This is how we think diffusion operates in olivine or how magma magmatic systems behave. This is related to all of our assumptions that we put into our models. And so this is related to a prior distribution. So this is the probability of our parameters given the hypothesis. So this is usually, um, this would be the, the probability of, the, of our parameters related to the uncertainties and how we think they are related, like the covariance matrices. And then we have this term called the likelihood, and this is the probability of the data given the uh, parameters and the hypothesis or model. And so ultimately what this is trying to assess is the compatibility of our model given our parameters with the measured data. And so often the way we assess this is with a, uh, what we call a likelihood function or a log likelihood function. And so what we use here is we look at the difference between our observed data and our model data and divided by the uncertainty or the standard deviation of each measurement. And then these are all normalized by this uh, term called the Bayesian evidence. So what we're really interested in is looking at what is the posterior distribution at the maximum likelihood. So where our models best fit our data. And so to do this, we have to use a, um, a Monte Carlo approach and so here we use this uh, sort of, um, algorithm called Multinest, which was uh, originally used um, or originally developed for cosmology and uh, particle physics. Um, 
and now has just started to have more geological um, applications. And so this uh, is a type of um, Bayesian inversion package uh, called nested sampling. And the way this works is, so we have this plot here. And so imagine this is a, a map in likelihood space, and this is like a hill where the maximum likelihood is this region here. And so what it will, um, the model will initially do is it will um, draw lots of um, parameters from our prior distributions and try and characterize some kind of uh, space, uh, ellipse in likelihood space. So it's a bit like um, in like a mapping exercise where you have like uh, spot heights or something and then you draw like a, a contour around it. And then what happens is, uh, so it clusters all these points into this ellipse and then it will keep drawing more random points from our priors and then assess whether the, and assess the likelihood so the fit of the model to the data. And so then it will find whether the likelihood of the, the new point is higher than the lowest point in the current cluster. And so then this, what this allows it to do is when it runs loads and loads of times is it will basically zero in on the, the region of maximum likelihood. And so eventually this will converge and reach a point where the increase in the likelihood is so small that it doesn't matter anymore. And it'll be, okay, we've converged, so um, it will stop. Um, so here's an example of this kind of um, Monte Carlo approach in action. So hopefully you can see lots of points dancing around. Um, and so perhaps one of the powerful aspects of this approach is now we can actually um, model multiple elements simultaneously. Um, so here we have an example of phosphorite, nickel, and manganese, and olivine. So we can use observations from different elements um, to ob say, obtain a single time scale. And this might be useful. Uh, maybe in, for elements of using elements of different diffusivity or with different closure temperatures, maybe. But in this instance, we have to be quite confident that the, the zoning of these elements represents the same magmatic event. Anyway, so the um, the red the red lines are the prior distributions. So for time, we use uh, a uniform or log uniform prior. So there's an equal probability of selecting a time over this distribution. For temperature, we use a, a Gaussian uh, prior. Likewise, for the ferric, con uh, ferric ion content of the melt or the oxygen scarcity, and then the pressure. And so for the diffusion coefficients, we use multivariate Gaussian priors, um, which can be seen here. So this is just for one element, um, iron magnesium into diffusion. And what you can see is that there's covariance between some of these parameters. Um, and so ultimately what happens is we keep picking random uh, numbers from these, these priors and assess the, the model fit and eventually we'll reach the point of um, maximum likelihood. Uh, in some instances, uh, yeah, points get picked out of the outside the priors, but this can tell us something perhaps interesting about what's happening. Okay, so, um, now we can compare our, once we run a model, so here's just a synthetic model I made for iron magnesium into diffusion in olivine from just an initial simple step. Uh, so we can compare our posterior distributions to those of our priors. And so the, the density plots of the posteriors, the red lines again, are our priors. And so what in most cases in this simple example is that the posteriors generally just fall within the prior range, which tells us that this is only really useful for uh, error propagation. In the case of um, the time, though, um, the posterior is not necessarily controlled by the prior, and it, which tells us that it's the data that's driving its distribution, which is what you basically expect because, um, you know, diffusion is a, a time, time-driven process. Um, and like I said, sometimes our parameters can actually converge outside our priors, which may tell us something about uh, the assumptions of our model or may tell us something interesting about uh, the system. Um, so here's a, an example where we've ran some models, uh, additional models, where the one model we've assumed that there's independence between all of our um, diffusion coefficient related parameters and then models where we have covariance, which is run a single element and um, multiple elements. 
And so this really highlights the importance of accounting for this covariance in our uncertainty propagation. So when we just assume everything's independent, the, the time posterior is really much larger um, compared to when we account for covariance. And so this, this could be quite a large effect and, and it probably will depend on uh, the mineral or the elements of interest as well as maybe the, the time scale. And so perhaps this is uh, a good note for those uh, experimentalists. Maybe it's worth starting to publish covariance matrices with your um, harmonious relationships so people can account for these. Um, so just a quick word on on uh, on computing, um, and it really depends on uh, what you're trying to model. Um, and so generally, uh, these kind of models require like thousands of uh, simulations in order to um, reach convergence. Um, and so usually if you have more complexity, then you require more um, computing time. So if, if, for example, you were running uh, an analytical solution to the diffusion equation, then maybe you could get away with running this thing, this kind of thing on your laptop. Whereas numerical models will take longer. And so you might need something a bit more fancy. Likewise, the same goes for the differences between um, 1D versus 2D, or even 3D. I mean, I've never, I've never gone up to 3D, but, um, and also like, likewise, the number of parameters. So um, if you're uh, adding more elements or uh, more intensive parameters, then it's gonna take longer. So you might need more uh, computing power. And so things like Phoenix and PyMultiNest, which is the Python-based uh, wrapper around Multinest, uh, can support parallel programming. So it means you can run things on multiple cores. And so the more cores, the better. And so, yeah, if you were thinking of trying to do this for a 3D thing, then maybe you would need something like a, a mega supercomputer or, or something like that. Um, so I was just going to go through one quick example of potentially Another powerful aspect of this method is that is a parameter, estim um, parameter estimation. Um, even for some of the diffusion related parameters made. Um, and so in this example, we'll be looking at clinolivine. And so here's a plot from uh, Kendra Lin. And basically um, what I want you to focus on is that um, generally nickel is considered a similar has a similar diffusivity to iron magnesium and manganese and often nickels usually modeled with a an isotropy of about um, six so it's six times faster along 001 compared to um, 010 and 100 and so here are some uh, profiles i measured uh, for this icelandic eruption called skugafjet and i guess the main thing i want you to take away from this so here's the, the four stripe profile Here's the um, nickel profile. Um, what you can generally see is that the nickel profiles are generally a lot shorter than the um, iron magnesium or the forstrite ones. And so is this a quirk of growth or is there something else happening? And so um, when we ran these models um, with um, the different crystals from this eruption, so the, the blue diamond, so these are all the kind of diffusion coefficient parameters in the, the regressions I showed you earlier. Um, well, and the blue diamond is the uh, prior and its uncertainty. And the, the gray cumulative frequency curves are the, post uh, the posterior distributions for each model crystal. And so what you can generally see is in some of these parameters, um, the posteriors are converging outside of the, the priors. So it tells us that something else is potentially happening. And so as I said, is it maybe related to growth or is there something else? And potentially one explanation for this could be related to the anisotropy. So um, some more recent experiments done by Spandler and Eel have found that diffusion of iron magnesium along the 001 uh, and nickel are quite similar. But when we look at the, the diffusion down the other directions, then maybe nickel is actually uh, slower. So in these models, the, it's trying to account for this slight difference in diffusivity, so it's changing the diffusion coefficient a little bit, but maybe this can be resolved by actually using um, a different anisotropy. 
Okay, so I just wanted to quickly run through some examples that I've been working on from Iceland. Um, and so we're going to be uh, looking at this eruption from northern Iceland um, called Borgroin. And so this, there's been a lot of patrological work done on this eruption. It's really well characterized. Uh, and basically what the petrological evidence suggests is that um, this eruption crystallized from primary mantle melt uh, close to the Moho. So the crystal cargo is composed of very uh, primitive uh, four strike 892 to 87 olefines and then kind of different methods of barometry such as clinoproxene liquids, um, OPAM, which is the olivine plagioclase orchite um, melt to eutectic position, they all suggest quite deep crystallization. So what we wanted to find out was maybe if it's possible to see how long this magma was stored here and also how long it took to travel to the surface prior to eruption. And so um, one of the, the really interesting things about this eruption and its crystal cargo is these really cool uh, whirlite nodules and they have um, CPX uh, oikocrysts and um, spinel and olivine chattercrysts and perhaps the one of the really cool interesting things of these nodules is that the spinels are quite zoned in the chrome and aluminium contents um, they're surrounded by these really thin lenses of like melt in some in some cases like what dan showed earlier these faces have been completely shut off whereas the faces so have been completely enclosed by cpx but the faces still connected to the melt are uh, have more prominent zoning. And also important to note is the smaller spinels in these nodules are completely homogeneous and have compositions similar to that of the rims. Um, and the core composition or the core chrome numbers of these spinels scales with their size. So you think this is possibly related to a, a diffusion related process where these big spinels are kind of retaining their core composition or they're retaining some disequilibrium, whereas these smaller crystals are getting closer to. Uh, being equilibrated. And so um, what we did was we modeled the diffusion of chrome aluminium in these uh, spinels with the assuming interchange with the surrounding melt lenses. Um, we did assume just an initial uh, flat initial condition. So we, like Dan says, it's kind of a maximum time scale, but there might have been a little bit of growth associated with these. And so what we generally find is we get when we apply our Bayesian model, we can look at trade-offs between temperature and time, is we get generally fairly consistent timescales on the order of about um, 1,500 years or so. Interestingly, this crystal where I initially measured this not really thinking about the melt lenses, this gives a shorter timescale because it's been um, basically cut off by the, the growth of CPX. Um, so yeah, so we're finding we're getting these very consistent timescales on the order of um, maybe 1500 years. And I'll uh, discuss what we think this represents in a, in a little bit. But we also find there's some consistency with uh, the equilibration of plagioclase crystals in the same eruption, which give a minimum estimate um, of kind of residence. And so we can say with our models that 95% of our, our timescales are less than, say, 4,000 years. Um, and so now we're interested in how quickly these magmas can uh, ascend to the surface. So what we did was we looked at um, the, the rims of these olivine crystals in contact with the melt. So you can see, maybe if you squint, uh, there's some zoning in these, um, these maps. Um, and so what we wanted to do was basically a model diffusion across this boundary, which would give us an estimate of just pre-eruptive residence time and associated transports. Um, and so one of the things we wanted to try and do was to try and account for, uh, or try and get a more realistic estimate of the initial conditions. And so um, often a lot of what, what a lot of people try and do is look at elements with different diffusivities. And so one element we tried to look at in olivine was um, aluminium which is generally considered to be a quite a slow diffuser, but there are some more recent experiments that suggest there might be a more uh, faster subsidiary mechanism, but it might not be prominent in natural olivines. 
But what we generally found when we measured these crystals was there was some decoupling between uh, aluminum and, say, forsterite um, in some crystals, whilst um, in others, we found there was actually very little decoupling uh, between these two uh, elements. And so what we think this represents is likely these crystals, um, are deco the decoupled crystals ha maybe had some diffusion. Uh, and so this gives us some confidence that maybe we can use aluminium as a initial condition. Whereas these other crystals where there's very little decoupling at all, these are most likely growth, growth related or growth dominated. Um, and so the way we often generated these initial conditions was we had assumed a linear relationship between uh, these two different elements. Um, and I guess a, a note of caution, I guess, and relating to what Dan was meant to talk about earlier, uh, you have to really know what the zoning represents. So um, the change in aluminium profile probably represents maybe the crystallization of uh, plagioclase and CPX, whereas the change in force strike contents is more likely reflecting the growth of the olivine. And as we're kind of quite confident, we see these three phases at the same time, all these processes are probably occurring at the same time. Um, but yeah, it might not be possible to use aluminium in other situations. Um, okay, so then we modeled the, the diffusion of uh, aluminium, um, not aluminium, sorry, uh, iron, magnesium, nickel, uh, manganese uh, concurrently for these three, uh, for uh, maybe 20 or so crystals from this eruption. And what we found was we also got fairly consistent results. There's some weird crystals that give very short time scales. Um, but on the whole, they generally range from about a few, like five days to um, a couple of weeks. Um, we subdivided these based on growth dominated versus decoupled crystals. So these growth dominated crystals maybe give or give shorter times than the decoupled ones. And what we're confident of saying is that we're less than we're 95% of our timescales are less than uh, maybe 37 days. Um, so to put these into some kind of petrological context, what we think was happening was um, there was some kind of uh, concurrent mixing and crystallization of primary magmas near, near the Moho. These crystals settled out. They were then kind of sequestered in this um, crystal mush environment, which is a little bit cooler or colder. And here, the kind of crystals were re-equilibrating with um, melt lenses. They were slowly being enclosed by the growth of uh, clinoproxene. And so our big spinels are attaining some uh, disequilibrium. Our smaller spinels are reaching or reach equilibrium with the local environment. And then finally, there's um, this period of mush overturn, which disaggregates all these crystals and then nodules into this new carrier liquid, which then transports these crystals to the surface um, in the matter of days to weeks. Um, and so just to summarize, I don't really know how much time I've been talking, but um, um, what we can say is that maybe, yeah, finite elements may offer an efficient and flexible way to kind of solve some complex uh, diffusion related problems. Um, we can maybe use Bayesian inference to try and start exploring the uncertainty structure related with the, to diffusion time scales. And um, there's also maybe a powerful method where we can use parameter, uh, estimate, uh, parameter estimate, why is it estimation? Estimation, um, which means maybe we can maybe use some natural observations to inform as about, uh, as about the, the diffusion process. And I guess the theme of this meeting is that models are only really as good as our current understanding. There's still loads of room for improvement. Um, for example, we need better understanding of diffusion mechanisms and the physical phenomena uh, in magmatic systems. But hopefully this will obviously get better over time. Um, and so just a, a shameless plug, if you're interested in uh, some of these methods, we have a preprint currently out, uh, kind of uh, slugging through the revisions uh, at the moment, but hopefully the main paper will be out sometime next year. And then if you're interested in this Iceland story, then uh, there's some papers here you can also have a look at. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening. Thanks a lot for this talk. And yeah, I think the 
I, I remember having spent hours and hours in the uh, several workshops and, and meetings talking about the uncertainty uh, of, our, of our diffusion data. And I'm, I'm pretty sure Dan and Schumit have a lot of things to say there as well. So the stage is open for questions. So we are still waiting for questions. I think your last point uh, nicely connects to the discussion we had yesterday in terms of what limits us to make the next big step towards the, the improvement in, in the diffusion community. So I see Schumit is coming on. Schumit, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, how much detail do you have in that paper, in the preprint, Ian? Because my question is very straightforward. I, want to try to do these things and it's going to take a lot of learning. So I want to know how much detail you have provided in there. Uh, yeah, so there's, I guess, quite a bit of detail in the, the preprint. One of the, um, the reviewer's comments was it was the paper was too long. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, also the, the, the code is going to be available. I, I need to kind of make it a bit more user friendly. I guess there's a difference between writing code for yourself and then letting other people be able to understand it. But um, yeah, I'm currently in the process of trying to uh, make that so. Um, but yeah. I, um, yeah, because I think if the details are available, there's a lot one can explore with these tools. So this is yeah. just very new and uh, a lot of things. Oh, yeah. We can try to do do with that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. We've only like I've only just like I don't know, just dipped my toe in the water. There's so like there's so much that can be explored with these. Somebody um, start. So. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the the questions are coming in. We start with a question from Johan. If you would unmute yourself, please. Yeah. Um. Thanks, Johan. That was really interesting. Um. I've got a question about um, essentially the relative importance of growth versus diffusion. So I guess that's one of the key decisions you needed to make for the Borgerine um, example that you showed. So um, the, in terms of the, the spinel zoning, so what criteria did you use to, to sort of discriminate growth during cooling from diffusion? Um, so I guess in like the spinel case, I guess we, yeah, we looked at, the, I guess, the size of the spinels. And their distribution. Um, we also, I guess, looking at the difference in like um, the zoning properties. And so it's like some crystals where they've definitely have been like fully sealed off by um, CPX. They look like they just stopped diffusing. Whereas I guess crystals, parts of the crystal that are still connected to the melts are still evolving. I guess. Um, so those are like the main. The main criteria that we that we used, um, but I mean, there might be like significant growth, but we can I guess really find it. Okay. Um, then we have another question from Erie, who's interested whether you can include analytical uncertainties or whether those are insign uh, insignificant in comparison. Yeah. So I guess the analytical uncertainties are kind of they are kind of included, I guess. Um, so. The way we, that, that this like likelihood function works, I guess, is there's the kind of analytical uncertainties included in that. So ultimately what will happen is it will try and fit elements that have a better um, better uncertainty or better, so it will fit observations that we have a better certainty of. Um, I mean, it might be possible to Monte Carlo the positions of the points of in their uncertainties, but um, I haven't really attempted that um, as okay. of yet. So there's another question by Dan, who's interested whether you use a multi-element approach to resolve the initial state assumption as part of your solution. And if so, does that swap an initial square wave for an initial elemental correlation? No, that would that well. Well, I guess I didn't really do that, but that'd be something really, really, really cool to try. Yeah. So, um, just including uh, parameters on the initial condition or um, 
even like the boundary conditions, they might tell you something about the, the rates of growth or that kind of thing. Um, I mean, I've obviously kept this quite simple initially, but there's loads of, I guess, space to expand and to looking at other things. Yeah, then there are comments and questions from Roy. Roy, I think it would be easier if you just would unmute yourself. Sure. Do sure. this directly. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> thanks Thomas. Um, uh, the first was a comment, really. Um, you referred to the fact that maybe with uh, CT data, we might be able to provide a 3D data set um, for this for the kind of analysis that you showed. And I think we are now, we, the system would have to be um, carefully selected to make sure we had good electron density contrast. But I think there are heavy enough tracers and light enough matrices where we could do this. Even I've even been thinking perhaps we could even do it experimentally. So that was my comment. My question, oh yeah, I'm being, I'm being rude. I'm not even, I don't even have my camera on. Sorry for that. It was a great talk. It was really interesting. Um, a huge amount of information to process. Um, but, uh, but one thing I wanted to ask you about, you showed an, uh, numerical analysis with covariance. And you showed several elements covariating together, very strong covariance. But I noticed that they were all divalent metals. And I just wondered if you've done that kind of comparison for a, something with a very, very different chemistry. Uh, no, I, well, no, I haven't. I've only really like stuck to the kind of main elements that people use in olivine, but yeah, this is obviously something that's, um, that would also be really cool to investigate. Um, even like looking at elements of significantly different activation energies, say, that might tell us um, maybe something about the temperature. Maybe, I mean, maybe the uncertainties in the diffusion coefficients are too large at this point, but maybe a dream that I would have is like uh, maybe using this as like a thermometer, but maybe it's not possible at this time. But yeah, looking at elements of different diffusivities and uh, yeah, different valences and different sites might really reveal something powerful about what's happening. Thanks a lot. Are yeah. there more questions? So if that's not the case, we can move on to the more general round of discussion. And I would like yesterday ask all the speakers from today and yesterday to yeah come back on screen so that people can see you and us. <clears throat> and okay, Schumit, hey. you maybe want to comment on that and open the discussion. Well, I just wanted to add to that, that uh, people have actually uh, determined temperatures from profiles. So there's a paper by Raut and Werner, I think 2019 or maybe even 2020, where they did just that. They actually looked at the profiles and used that to get temperatures rather than time scales. Well, yeah, it'd be super cool if we could do something like this, but I'm always a bit hesitant, certainly with like, uh, with like magmatic systems where, you know, temperatures are changing so much and, you know, there's so much complexity. Um, so there would be always some kind of a simplistic assumptions associated with those, but I don't know, maybe, yeah, it could be really useful um, if it works. Yeah, it worked well in that case, that one example which they had. Yeah. I think they use sanidines. So what would be the, uh, oh, wait, wait, Dan is here. Dan, just, just come on, I'll unmute yourself. Oh, okay. I was just going to say, um, we've used all sorts of quirks of diffusion over the years to estimate all sorts of fun things. So if more elements you use, you can actually solve an extra intensive parameter each time you do that, um, in theory. I would say that there is a bit of a, a question about how one does that. So, um, I had a go at that during my PhD and I've published a slightly obscure paper in contributions in Min and Pet on this, where we were trying to run, say, strontium profile against a barium profile. 
and you take the barium profile, which is usually steeper because it's a slower diffusing profile, and you run it forwards in time until it matches up most closely with, say, the strontium profile. And you can actually then work out both how much time it had to decouple. That's one way you can use it. If you then have a third element, you can actually independently solve for the temperature at which that would actually be a unique solution. So there are quirky methods you can use. It replaces the initial state assumption. In fact, we don't care what the initial profile was in that kind of situation because we're only doing forward modeling from our data. But we are assuming that at some point in the past, when the crystal grew, the barium and the strontium profiles were effectively proportionate. So they're related by a partition coefficient. So there are fun methods you can use where you mess about a bit with what you're trying to get out of these things, but we end up replacing one initial state assumption with another one, which may or may not be valid, which is a slight quirk. Um, the other thing to return to that idea of using it for temperatures, we, we actually use um, titanium in quartz in the Balahulish Oriole to, as a thermometer. So it started out as a fourth year project and uh, we kind of ran a variety of different titanium and quartz parameterizations and we ended up finding a diffusion situation where uh, the diffusivity of titanium and quartz could actually be used to just turn this around. We had nice diffusion profiles, but we could actually use it as a thermometer with actually really very good precision purely because of that extreme temperature dependence of diffusivity. So there's some fun ones that you can do with strange models. Maybe coming back to Claire's question from yesterday, today with a little bit more focus on thermochronology and igneous systems. What are the big challenges? What are the big next steps where we need to go? Uh, I think one thing that's really ex well, potentially exciting is the fact that a lot of these, uh, so things like melts or like thermodynamic software is now moving towards being like a Python based open source thing. And so now it's, it's now possible to start incorporating uh, different types of software together. So it basically allows us now to um, I guess, yeah, incorporate maybe uncertainties in like the thermodynamic models or uh, look at different crystallization pathways or how it's changing the, the composition of, I don't know, the melt within its uncertainties can affect things. Um, so usually, I guess, melt is currently like a GUI that people would have to run manually like a hundred times, which is... You know, now potentially you can just do that with like the click of a button. Um, so it really kind of opens up um, a lot more in terms of um, exploring um, the effects of magma dynamics and that's, that kind of thing. I think certainly in terms of the, the metamorphic and sort of geochronology side of things is that our the diffusion parameters now are the biggest uncertainty compared to the analytical uncertainties. So when we're trying to sort of fit data to models or assess data against models, actually the, the diffusion parameter uncertainties are so big that it, it's just this, you, you lose a lot of stuff in the detail. So if we're trying to figure out whether diffusion, for example, of argon in muscovite is the most important reason why argon ages in muscovite tend to be uh, younger than, than uranium lead ages in zircon in the same rock, then, then we need to know our diffusion parameters better so that we can start looking at whether it's diffusion or deformation or recrystallization or, or any of these other um, processes that are operating. So that'd be my big one. <laughs> 